Hey there, it is good to be together to study with you again tonight. I hope you're having a good week, and I hope to see you this coming Sunday for worship at either 9 or 11 a.m., and then I hope all of us can come together for class at 10. And for our members, please remember to use the Sign Up Genius account to sign up for one of the two worship services. It's based on your address in the church directory. Those email addresses are pre-approved. But guests are always welcome, and so if you can join us, we would love to have you with us this coming Sunday at 9, 10, and 11. So 9 and 11 for worship and 10 o'clock for the Bible class. Tonight we are continuing with our study of the book of Acts. Acts, of course, explains the growth of the early church, and it is written by Luke, who is a medical doctor. He is writing to a man by the name of Theophilus, and it covers a period of time from roughly 30 to 60 A.D., and up to this point in the book, we've looked at the first nine chapters. We are partway through chapter 10 tonight. In the ABCs of Acts, we have had the ascension. We've had the beginning of the church. The man who couldn't walk was carried and cured. We had that in chapter 3. We had the determined disciples who wouldn't stop preaching in Acts chapter 4. In Acts 5, we had the empty jail as Peter and the other apostles are arrested and then they are let out of jail by the angel. We had the first deacons, but always with a question mark appointed there in Acts chapter 6. In Acts 7, we had Stephen, the great hero. In Acts 8, we had the eunuch's response to Philip's question, do you understand what you are reading? And of course, the eunuch replies, well, how can I unless someone guides me? And so that's our summary for chapter 8, how can I? In Acts 9, in the vision on the road to Damascus, the Lord identifies himself to Saul, I am Jesus. And last week, we moved into Acts 10, as we're now introduced to a Roman centurion living in Caesarea. He is a man by the name of Cornelius. He is God-fearing. He gives alms to the Jewish people. He prays continually, but he is a Gentile. Nevertheless, in response to that prayer, an angel tells him to send for Peter, who is staying in Joppa, 38 miles south down the coast. And so we have journey to Joppa as a summary for chapter 10. At the same time, Peter down in Joppa sees a vision of an unclean uh, a sheet full of unclean animals being lowered in that sheet with the message, arise, Peter, kill and eat. And of course, Peter objects at first. This is something he's never done in his, his, his entire life. But as he is kind of thinking about this, as he is mulling this over, the messengers from Cornelius arrive and Peter goes with them to Caesarea, arriving two days later. Well, when Peter gets there, Cornelius has assembled his friends and his family and they are already there waiting and they are ready to hear a message from God through the Apostle Peter. And that's where we pick up uh, this week. Our first paragraph tonight is Acts 10, verses 34 through 43. Acts 10, 34 through 43, as Peter now starts speaking. Acts 10, 34 through 43. Opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. But in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee, after the baptism which John proclaimed. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God, that is, to us, who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. In verse 34, as Peter speaks, notice the first thing he does is to recognize publicly that God does not show partiality. And he says this in a way that makes it personal to him, personal to him, Peter, that is. I most certainly 
understand this now. In other words, I used to not understand this, but now I do. And so it seems then Peter is admitting a shift in his understanding on this issue. So he had perhaps misunderstood God through the years on this, but God does not show partiality. God has not prejudged anybody. But instead, Peter points out here that God welcomes anybody who fears him, anybody from any nation, from any nationality. If you fear God, if you do what is right in his eyes, you are welcome before the Lord. And I hope we notice the two qualifiers here. We must fear God, and we must also actually do what is right. These two go together. And since we know the conclusion of this chapter, we know that Peter is aiming for something here, isn't he? He already knows that Cornelius fears God. We established that in last week's study. But what Cornelius is lacking is obedience to the gospel. Not that he wasn't willing, but he really he didn't know what he needed to do at this point. That's why Peter is here, to preach the gospel message. So in verse 36, Peter points out that God sent his word first to the sons of Israel, pre pre preaching peace through Christ. And notice how uh, Peter throws in there, he is Lord of all. And so even though his word went first to the Jews, God is Lord, not just of the Jews, but of all people everywhere. And so again, Peter is working up to something here. Cornelius is not a Jew, but he certainly falls under this category of all. And then he starts where they are. You know the story of Jesus, at least part of it. They know what happened with uh, Jesus in Judea. It started in Galilee, and there was John, his message of baptism, and so on. They know about the ministry of Jesus, how he was appointed by God, uh, anointed by God with the Holy Spirit and power. Uh, they know the good that Jesus did, the healings, the casting out of demons, and so on. Jesus did these things because God was with him. Peter also throws in here that he knows these things, not because he's been told, not because it was handed down to him in some way, but because he personally is an eyewitness. And so Peter has seen these things with his own eyes. Notice Peter then makes his way to the gospel, doesn't he? The good news concerning Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Notice in the middle of verse 39 how Peter says that they put him to death by hanging him on a cross. Who is the they in that reference? If we look back a few words into the middle of verse 39, Peter is really, he's putting this on the Jews, isn't he? Remember, Peter himself is a Jew. But it seems to me as if Peter is being as, as diplomatic as possible here, isn't he? Yes, Jesus was murdered, not specifically by Gentiles, but by the Jewish people. This is something they did. Yes, all of us are responsible in a sense. But Peter's preaching to a specific audience here, trying to convince these people that they are welcome in God's kingdom. So I, this may or may not be significant, but that's something that kind of uh, something I noticed there. But after his death on the cross, God lifted him up on the third day. Uh, it seems to me that the burial is implied here. It's not specifically mentioned. Um, but to be raised up, obviously, you, you have to be down somewhere. So Jesus was in the tomb, but he was raised up. And so I would see this as a reference to his death, burial, and resurrection, which, of course, is the gospel message. And again, Peter identifies himself as a witness. He is one of many witnesses. And he knows from personal experience that the resurrected Jesus was not a ghost of some kind. It was not just a vision, uh, but they actually ate and drank with him after his resurrection. In verse 42, Peter seems to start uh, to bring it around to like why he's here today. So he's getting more serious. He's applying this. This Jesus who lived and died and was buried and was raised, the same Jesus who ordered us to preach to the people. And this Jesus has been appointed by God to judge the living and the dead. So I just want us to notice here how universal this language is. Peter doesn't emphasize how Jesus commanded them to preach to the Jews, but he emphasizes the command to preach to the people. He emphasizes how the Lord will judge the living and the dead. It's hard to get more universal than that, isn't it? Cornelius and his household certainly fall into these categories. They are people and they are certainly um, either living or dead, or will be. And the same thing continues in verse 43. All the prophets uh, from all points in the past point to the salvation 
that's coming in the name of Jesus, the kind of salvation that's available to everyone who believes in him. So the good news is absolutely for everyone. So let's continue tonight with Acts 10 verses 44 through 48. Acts 10, 44 through 48. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter answered, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay on for a few days. As Peter is speaking, the Holy Spirit then falls on those who are listening. And this happens in a way that those who come along with Peter are amazed. They're amazed at being able to hear Cornelius and his household speaking with tongues. That is, they were miraculously speaking in other languages, as we learn elsewhere in the Bible. And they were using these other languages to praise God. And even before we get to come, what comes next, uh, think back to the first time we hear people miraculously speaking in other languages in the Bible. Doesn't it go back to the day of Pentecost? And on the day of Pentecost, who were those who were speaking in tongues? Well, it was the 12 apostles. And I would like to ask before we get into the next few verses, were the apostles saved because they spoke in tongues? No, that wasn't something that saved them, but instead it was a sign from God. In the same way, when we get to this account in Acts 10, uh, Peter sees this or he hears this, I guess more, more accurately we would say, he hears the speaking in tongues, he sees what's going on here, and he says, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did. Can he? Well, we're heading for baptism here, aren't we? Water is referred to. But Gentiles had never yet been baptized before this moment. So this is highly unusual. This is not the normal practice. This has never happened before. This is a brand new thing for Peter. And it's also a brand new thing for the Gentiles, isn't it? But upon hearing them speak in tongues, it's obvious that the next step already has God's approval. So God is basically saying here, go ahead. So Peter orders them then to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That is, he orders them to be baptized by the authority of Jesus in his name, by his authority. And this, by the way, is exactly what Jesus personally told Peter and the other apostles to do back in Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Remember, they were to go into all the world and they were told there to baptize pretty much everybody they could in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So Peter is obeying Jesus' command by commanding others to be baptized. Not only that, but I hope we notice a parallel between this and what happened back in Acts chapter 2 when Peter said, Repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. The baptism in Acts 2 was commanded in the name of Jesus Christ. And it was also for the forgiveness of sins. The baptism here in Acts 10 was also by the authority of Jesus Christ. And so I think it's safe to assume or to conclude that it would also be for the forgiveness of sins, even though it's not explicitly stated. It is the same baptism. It's being done in the name of Jesus. This is why it is commanded and not just suggested or recommended or to join a church of your choice, as we sometimes see people trying to say today concerning uh, the so-called purpose of baptism. But Cornelius and his household are baptized in response to an order from an apostle. Cornelius was certainly quite familiar with obeying orders. By the way, uh, some will take this passage and will try to suggest that Cornelius must have had little children in his household. The entire household was baptized. Therefore, some will conclude, we have God's permission to baptize babies and little children today. I don't know if you've heard that. I've heard it a number of times. 
That argument, though, is built on the assumption that Cornelius must have had babies at home, when in reality we have no evidence of this. In fact, anybody high enough in rank and experience to be a centurion most likely is older. And if he had kids, they might very well have been grown at this point. Uh, plus, household would include Cornelius' servants. And we know that he had servants and personal attendants, don't we? Because three of them made that journey over to Joppa or down to Joppa. And I mention this because some people will try to use this passage uh, to support infant baptism, but it doesn't support it at all. Um, I will not risk my children's salvation on the remote chance that Cornelius might have had babies at home. Uh, some will reply, well, what harm could it do to baptize my baby? I've had this discussion a number of times through the years. People will uh, call the church line and they'll say, hey, can you baptize my baby? I'll explain we have no examples of babies being baptized in the scripture, plus it Kind of, there is no point to it. If baptism is for the forgiveness of sins, babies don't have sins, so there's really no need for you to baptize your baby. And at that point, a lot of them will say, well, well, why don't you just go ahead and do it anyway? I mean, what harm could it do? It can do a lot of harm to baptize a baby. Millions of children have grown up in this world thinking that they have already been baptized and that they're good to go with God, but that is not the case at all. Infant baptism gives a false sense of security that lasts for a lifetime. And I'll have nothing to do with that. If invited, I will not attend. If asked to do it, I will not do it. I cannot give the impression that I approve in any way whatsoever. It really, it borders on abuse uh, to baptize a baby against their will and to allow them to grow up with the impression that they've already been baptized. It, it's a horrible thing to do. Um, anyway, after Cornelius and has, his household are baptized, they ask Peter to stay on for a few days, uh, which he does. And I say that because the news of these baptisms beats Peter back to Jerusalem. <laughs> uh, news travels very quickly, and as you can imagine, with something this new and this groundbreaking, uh, they now face some possible repercussions from this. Those who uh, weren't there might obviously object to this and that's certainly uh, what uh, brings us to what happens next so let's continue tonight with acts 11 1 2 and 3 acts 11 1 through 3 and as you might be able to see as we move over into chapter 11 we've now added k to the abcs of acts kingdom includes gentiles so this is a huge transition in the book of Acts, and it, it does create some controversy. The kingdom now includes Gentiles, and now the fallout starts. Now they have to deal with this. So let's pick up then with Acts 11, verses 1, 2, and 3. Now the apostles and the brethren who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised took issue with him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. All right, so just as we anticipated objections, this is exactly what happens. When word gets around, the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter makes his way back to Jerusalem, those who are circumcised, that is the Jews, probably a reference to kind of a hardcore inner circle of Jews who were really into this, um, they take issue with Peter. They object to this. And initially, their main concern is that Peter ate with them. And I kind of find that amazing. Their, their main concern isn't the baptism itself. It's that Peter ate with these other people. Remember, it was against their law to associate with Gentiles. And Peter has obviously done this. If he's studied with them and baptized them, these things are all connected. Well, we come to Peter's explanation, and uh, we come to his defense, we might say, in Acts 11, 4 through 14. So let's look at what Peter says next. Acts 11, verses 4 through 14. But Peter began speaking and proceeded to explain to them in orderly sequence, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, an object, coming down like a great sheet lowered by four corners from the sky, and it came right down to me. And when I had fixed my gaze on it and was observing it, I saw the four-footed animals of the earth and the wild beast and the crawling creatures and the birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing unholy or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a voice from heaven answered a second time, 
what God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. This happened three times, and everything was drawn back up into the sky. And behold, at that moment, three men appeared at the house in which we were staying, having been sent to me from Caesarea. The Spirit told me to go with them without misgivings. These six brethren also went with me, and we entered the man's house. And he reported to us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and have Simon, who is also called Peter, brought here. And he will speak words to you by which you will be saved, you and all your household. So notice Peter then summarizes what led up to the baptism of Cornelius and his household. He goes through it in an orderly sequence. And I think this kind of reminds me of, I think it's the beginning of Luke, where Luke makes a point of going through everything in chronological order. And so Luke makes sure to record that Peter is giving this some structure here. So he lays it out. Let me explain this to you. Uh, in the order in which it happened. So this is what happened. And in this orderly sequence, we're reminded of God's role in all of this. I think that's kind of highlighted here. Uh, Peter is praying. So there's a connection between Peter and God. He sees a vision. That's another connection between Peter and God. He hears the voice. Another uh, connection to God. The men from Caesarea show up. The Spirit tells him to go with them. So another connection or command from the Lord. And when he gets to Caesarea, Cornelius has a similar story on his side of things. So God has guided him through all of that as well. And so the conclusion here is God has arranged this. Uh, just a side note here, the angel tells Cornelius that Peter will speak words to him by which you will be saved. His salvation then will be tied to the preaching of the gospel. He will be saved by words in a sense. And I would just note here, his salvation will not be as a result of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. And I say this because the Spirit was poured out as Peter began to speak, not at the end of his sermon, but as he began to speak. So Cornelius was not saved before Peter's preaching, but he was saved as a result of it. We don't have salvation followed by the preaching of the gospel. That's not the way it works. But the preaching of the gospel must come before salvation. Otherwise, we might also say that Cornelius was saved before he had faith, right? Because faith comes from hearing the word of Christ. But we'll get back to that in just a moment. So let's pick up with Acts 11, verses 15 through 18. Acts 11, verses 15 through 18. Peter says, And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as he did upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if God gave to them the same gift as he gave to us also after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. In verse 15, I hope we notice how Peter makes a point of saying that the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as he did upon us at the beginning. And so even if this is all we had about this, Peter is saying that this was highly unusual. The beginning refers to the beginning of the church back in Acts chapter 2, and we see the parallels. In Acts 2, the Spirit came on the twelve apostles in a way that caused them to be able to speak in tongues. And this is what we have with Cornelius. And because Peter compares what happens here to what happened at the beginning, he seems to be saying that this hasn't happened since the beginning. It happened then in Acts chapter 2, and it has now happened here in Acts chapter 10. This is not normal. We don't normally have the Spirit falling on people directly in a way that gives them the miraculous ability to speak in other languages. We do have miraculous gifts between Acts 2 and Acts 10. But do you remember how those were passed on? They were passed on through the laying on of the apostles' hands, weren't they, as we saw in Acts chapter 8. But here, though, which is highly unusual, the Spirit works directly, and he does this as a sign. And that's the way Peter takes it, as a sign. In fact, as all of this is happening, Peter remembers how Jesus used to say, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. What happens in Acts 10 then with the Spirit falling on these people 
may be referred to as Holy Spirit baptism. Uh, this is not the baptism commanded afterwards. We aren't there yet. But this came before water baptism in this case. And it doesn't seem to be for salvation in any way, any more than the Spirit falling on the twelve apostles in Acts 2 resulted in their salvation. They were already saved at that point. Uh, but instead, the Holy Spirit baptism was intended as a sign on this occasion before Cornelius and his household were saved. In Acts 2, the sign was about to show that the twelve apostles had God's approval. Uh, what about here? Well, it's the same thing. After seeing this, Peter's conclusion is, if they experienced what we did, then who are we to stand in God's way? Remember, Peter is probably pretty cautious here. I think that'd be a safe thing to say. Yes, he's seen the vision. Yes, Cornelius has also heard from the angel. But this is so new. This is so different. He's looking for some kind of confirmation. And he gets it, doesn't he? He doesn't even have to ask for it. God anticipates this. When the Holy Spirit falls on Cornelius, just as he fell on the apostles at the beginning, Peter knows that what needs to happen here will happen with God's approval. I almost think about Philip preaching Jesus to the Ethiopian eunuch when the eunuch says, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip says, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And the eunuch answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. With Cornelius, the obvious objection is, he's a Gentile. So you see the parallel there? The Ethiopian officer, why can't I be baptized? You know, what's holding me back from doing this? And in this case, with Cornelius, he's a Gentile. That's the objection. That's the possible objection. Uh, this has never happened before. The Spirit, though, takes this objection away. The Spirit anticipates this. And Peter is now explaining all of this to the Jews back in Jerusalem who are objecting to all of this. So he's giving them a reason not to object. And in verse 18, Peter's explanation seems to work. Uh, this chronological little timeline going on here, this seems to do the trick. Uh, the Jews who objected, they quiet down. They glorify God, recognizing the Gentiles have also been given access to this repentance that leads to life. Next week, let's pick up with Acts 11, 19, if the Lord wills, as the gospel continues to spread. Um, tonight, though, the kingdom now includes Gentiles, and it's become clear to everybody. So this is a, a huge turning point in the book of Acts. If, if you can improve on kingdom includes Gentiles for this chapter, I'd love to hear from you. I think that's a pretty good one. Uh, those words starting with K are kind of rare these days in the book of Acts, but uh, kingdom includes Gentiles is what's going on. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to study together tonight. I hope to see you for worship on Sunday, either at 9 or 11. And please plan on joining us between those two services for a study from Hebrews at 10 a.m. If you're a member of the congregation, this would be a great time to sign up. Let me know if I can help. Your email in the church directory is kind of your passcode or whatever to get through the sign-up genius issue there. Uh, but if you're visiting with us, if you're a guest, if you aren't yet a member, I um, hope you can come on Sunday at 9 or 11 and then also for Bible class in the middle at 10. Please let me know if there's something we need to be praying about. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we know that you are a God who does not show partiality. We also know that you welcome all who fear you and all who do what's right. We ask, Father, for your continued grace and mercy as we learn and as we grow as your people. Tonight, we're thankful for the example of Cornelius, for his honest heart, for his eagerness to hear the good news, for his leadership within his own household, and for his ultimate obedience to your message. We pray that you would bless those who are studying your word, and we pray that we might be an encouragement in some way. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.